Um, good morning. Uh, thank you firstly to Michelle and Matthew for uh, coercing me into this. Um, it's good to see quite so many people here. We weren't quite expecting such a large crowd. Uh, this particular presentation is part promotion, but also partly to set a context in some ways for many of the technical talks that you'll be seeing through the rest of the day. Uh, I thank Cam as well. He's uh, quite uh, appropriately described uh, mineral systems, so I, hope, uh, so I was hoping you would do that, so I wouldn't have to go into any great detail there. So really what I'll be speaking about is just what uh, the Geological Survey, uh, in collaboration with its research partners, has been doing to help, or we hope help, the mineral industry in Western Australia specifically to uh, hopefully uh, gain greater success in discovering uh, Tier 1 uh, mineral deposits. So anyone who's in the, uh, the minerals exploration and mining space will be aware that working in WA, that our economy is very heavily dependent on, uh, on mineral resources, and that we certainly have a suite of ageing mines, declining discovery rates, uh, rising discovery costs, and long lead times between discovery and getting mines into production. A lot of these new discoveries um, that have been happening um, in the past have been in brownfields areas. There's been a focus on brownfields exploration, and there's also a recognition among many people, that that's not going to deliver the sorts of deposits that the state and many companies require to, uh, to really make a significant difference to, uh, to the economy and to company profit profitability and so on. So new discoveries are going to have to come from greenfield areas, the new tier ones, and they're likely to be in areas that are under significant cover. And many companies, or most companies, lack effective tools to at least target and then effectively explore through significant cover. And that then leads to a very high technical risk, really high cost, and of course that then leads companies to consider to go elsewhere where the technical risk uh, is lower. The GSWA and the state government don't want that. We want you to spend your dollars here. So the job of the geological survey is to essentially, at the very basic level, attract investment to WA. And we do that by enhancing perceptions of resource prospectivity within the state. And traditionally, we've done that by providing buckets and buckets of data. And uh, those of you who have been watching this closely will have seen vast data sets coming out in the last five to ten years. Now, we want to go beyond that in, uh, in the geological survey. Rather than just providing data, we want to take it that step further and add significant knowledge to the data, which then hopefully improves the likelihood of success for explorers and miners in the state. <coughs> so we want our work to help reveal new places to look for big mineral deposits, be they geographic or even conceptual. Oh, I hadn't thought of looking for that sort of mineral deposit before in the state. We want then that information to be used to support better, read more effective, cost-effective area selection and targeting for those in that job and that then improves the likelihood of exploration success. <laughs> and then if you spend your money here, the government's happy and I stay in the job. <laughs> so what I'll be doing today is just quickly giving a brief overview of what the GSWA and its uh, collaborative researchers is doing uh, from a resource-focused context, what we're doing in the mineral system space. And in doing that, I'll illustrate some reasonably new initiatives that the whole research community uh, in part directed by GSWA, have been doing in that mineral system space. Um, and then I'll look, uh, just quickly have a look at whether, from our perspective, we seem to be helping you, if there is actually uh, success. And uh, I'll quickly look then at some of the future activities that we plan. Now, in some ways, those future activities will depend on whether it's useful doing those. And I urge the community here to get properly engaged with the, uh, with the panel uh, at the end of the day, and if you think there are things we could be doing, then please let us know. Well, a mineral system, as Cam has so adequately explained, uh, is, from our point of view, uh, all geological factors that can control the, the generation and the preservation of mineral deposits, if you had to do it, had to define it in a sentence. So that includes um, defining the, the geological sources for metals and fluids, defining the pathways that transport that material to the trap sites, and then 
the subsequent history that uh, allows a large mineral system to actually be preserved and not eroded away. From a geological survey perspective, uh, that really is a conceptual model for us which encapsulates an understanding of the architecture and the geodynamic evolution of a terrain or of the whole state from our perspective, and we call that terrain characterization, and then an understanding of the metallogenic processes, the back then source, transport, track, preservation aspect for the different types of commodity product types, if you like. And then, most importantly, the relationship between terrain and process that uh, then allows you to, or allows us and companies to assess the prospectivity of the terrain for permissive types of mineral, mineral deposits and mineral systems. Now, the GSWA traditionally, um, for most of its history, has really emphasised terrain characterisation, re geological mapping. We've done lots and lots of geological mapping. The state's been mapped at one to 250,000 scale. About 40% of it's now been mapped at one to 100,000 scale. We've been progressively collecting large geophysical data sets, geochem geochemical data sets, geochronology, and it, mapping the endowment of terrains. So basically cat cataloguing mineral deposits in different terrains. And from that have been developing where we can regional architectural and tectonic syntheses. In uh, historically, where there's been limited data, obviously that last part has been fairly simple, simplistic uh, as we've been collecting more information and tapping into expertise both in WA and elsewhere in the world. Uh, we've evolved our procedures there to uh, increasing sophistication uh, as we get access to, to new data and tapping into to mines. The study of metal, metallogeny, actual processes by which different types of deposits form, we've largely left to others in the past. This has led to a bit of a mismatch where we have our data sets, people have then been tapping into the data sets that they can get access to and using those as a context for their, uh, for their metallogeny studies, but it's really been suboptimal. So what we've decided, um, since we've been given the opportunity, is to try and integrate those two aspects much more closely. Now we've been assisted with that with a boon from the state government for the last seven or eight years. The government's been very generous, recognising the importance of the industry to the state and has given us buckets and buckets of money. Uh, and that has allowed us to accelerate our traditional processes. So we have been able to complete the collection of large state-wide data sets. Uh, start collecting more detailed data sets in areas we may not have ever got to, such as ground-based high-resolution gravity. And we now have about 30% of the state covered, and that's an ongoing process. Accelerate our whole rock geochemistry collection, um, really spread out um, our reach in the geochronology data space, collaborating with, uh, with the world-class centres here. Um, get hold of other data sets that other uh, institutions may have collected, such as the, uh, the ASTA data. And we also, as part of this, acquired a high logger. And if you want to know more about that, please speak to, uh, to Lena, who's actually the manager of the high logger. Um, we've also been able to outsource a lot of the research that we've been involved in. Uh, we've been able to commission some of the, uh, the universities, particularly in WA, to basically do particular jobs uh, in the mineral system space, and I'll describe those in greater detail as, as I go through this. And also, because we understand that the bigger deposits are going to be coming from the less well understood or explored regions, we've been emphasising those, those particular terrains in the state. And I'll illustrate those. Now, I've already mentioned that we work with our peers in, uh, in other institutions. The scale of this task really does require collaboration. No one is and so we've been working with basically whoever wants to work with us, universities, uh, CET, UWA, Curtin, uh, also universities in other states. Uh, we've been working with the CSIRO, Geoscience Australia. We've been basically embedded our researchers into some of these institutions as well. So that there's uh, constant communication and, uh, and we get the most value for that. Uh, we get access to local and international world-class facilities mentioned we have our own high logger, we can also tap into the John DeLake Centre here, um, which with its geochronology uh, facilities. 
And of course, when we're looking at mineral systems and mineral deposits, we really need to work with industry as well. So wherever we can, we collaborate with industry. They give us the access to those systems that we need to or want to study. And I have to acknowledge the state government as well. They're a, a silent partner, if you like. They give us the money and uh, trust us to do with it uh, the best possible job. Now, in terms of our architectural or our terrain studies, we, through all this new work that we've been doing, we are ending up with new or improved interpretations of the terrain, architecture and evolution for significant areas in the state. Uh, better understanding of the terrain and amalgamation history, better understanding of these potential large-scale crustal uh, structures that may be controlling the, the transport and even the tracking of, of large mineral deposits. This provides then a much better framework for the metallogenic studies and then ultimately for the prospectivity analyses that derive from all of this knowledge. Now, in particular, for our terrain studies, we've been focusing, for instance, on the, the northeastern Yulgarn, uh, the Yulgarn to Musgrave transect, the uh, West Capricorn area, Albany Fraser uh, to Eucla area, and most recently, the Canning Coastal region, in terms of collecting large, deep seismic studies, plus the geological studies that go along hand in hand. And as I say, this is leading to a better appreciation of the three-dimensional architecture of these terrains. The little picture on the bottom of the diagram there is across the, uh, the western Capricorn. Uh, this study, these, this seismic study was done several years ago now, but what it has revealed is that there are several large cryptic deep structures. So uh, Barry commented on that in his question. Um, and what's more important is that once we know where these structures are and can correlate them with the surface, or where they might lay like the surface, we suddenly find that significant mineral deposits that we knew were in the, in the region seem to be correlating very closely uh, in a spatial sense. And so we start to think, well, maybe, maybe these structures are more significant, uh, and we can start factoring that into the metallurgy studies and then into the prospectivity analyses. Because these structures, as well as being defined in two dimensions of the site, they can then also be picked out in the, in the map-based large regional geophysical data sets. In terms of our metallogeny studies, uh, GSWA is shifting, as I said, more towards metallogeny studies, and we're also um, collaborating and in part directing some of the work being done by uh, our colleagues for, from a Western Australian perspective. So we've shifted beyond just simply cataloguing the, uh, the known mineralisation in the region, uh, and we're also doing this new work at both from, from the regional down to the deposit scale, and looking at it from an empirical through to a conceptual point of view, and we're also in these studies trying to emphasise the identification of uh, aspects or criteria that might be directly relevant to industry as well. So as well as prospectivity analyses, we're also trying to develop tools that industry may be able to use to directly detect mineralisation. In terms of some of the examples of the empirical studies that we're doing, well, we're trying to characterise the geology and metallogeny of selected mineral system types or commodity groups, if you like. These then inform our prospectivity analyses, so if we know better uh, the metallogeny of, for instance, volcanogenic massive sulphide systems in Western Australia specifically, that will then allow us to better predict where we might find other similar sorts of deposits. Now that, as I said, is concept we involve both uh, conceptual, trying to develop conceptual understanding and new direct detection methods. Uh, this is also, as I say, we're doing it in-house and we're also doing it collaboratively. And we're including industry in some of these studies as well. And I know there are people in our audience who are involved in that. But in terms of what we specifically are doing within GSWA, uh, we have people looking at uh, BMS systems uh, in the Murchison, the Capricorn, um, uh, mainly at the moment. Also, these are either deposit specific or looking at groups of deposits <coughs> trying to pick them apart, but also involving large scale fertility analyses for, uh, for particular terrain. So we have one embedded researcher with CSIRO who's looking at the geochemistry of all the felded volcanic rocks in, Western, in the Yulgarn and uh, using some of the tried or supposedly tried and tested uh, techniques to identify fertility for BMS in these regions and coming up with some quite interesting, uh, interesting results which we'll be publishing in due course. We also have people looking at uh, rare earth systems. Um, 
WA is well known for its carbonatite hosted uh, rearers. We also have a whole swag of, of other types of, of rear earth mineralization. Uh, for instance, uh, Mulga tank, which is, uh, or the rock, sorry, which is peat hosted. But more interestingly, we have these new hydrothermal vein hosted heavy rear earth deposits now being discovered in, uh, in northern Western Australia, and we're very interested in those. We uh, are keeping our attention on gold as well, being one of the major commodities, major earners in Western Australia. Uh, we have people working on uh, mostly in the, the Capricorn region, in the Ashburton region, at Paulson's, over in the Gascoigne, in, uh, uh, in the Glenburg region. So trying to basically understand why the gold is where it is and hopefully identify some of the criteria or tools that might be used to protect gold. We also have a, a large study looking into the metallurgy of iron systems in the Yilgarn and in the Pilbara. This is one of our uh, collaborative studies. We have embedded a researcher in, uh, in, Western, in the CET and you'll be hearing about iron as well. We're also looking at uh, fingerprinting the geochemistry of pyrite associated with particular types of mineral systems and also pyrite distal away from mineral systems trying to help develop a tool to, for that large distal footprint that Cam was talking about. And uh, diamonds, we also have a, a, a small interest in diamonds at the moment. At the moment this is really cataloging, just trying to work out what we know about the distribution of diamonds and the geochemistry of the, uh, the indicated minerals in the state. Now most of, as I say, throughout the day you'll be hearing a lot about these particular, some, many of these particular studies. So all I'm doing is setting the scene. We also have these conceptual studies going on and the biggest one we have at the moment is uh, also being done uh, by uh, CET, UWA uh, researchers. Uh, this is essentially a big uh, modelling um, sort of type of uh, project. We call it multi-scale dynamics of hydrothermal mineral systems. The principal part of it is numerical modelling of geodynamic and mineralising fluid migration processes. But it's uh, trying to be as, I guess, realistic as possible by modelling known areas in, from our point of view, Western Australia and uh, using supercomputers to try and predict the geodynamic evolution of a terrain with a particular starting configuration and trying to predict where the significant mineralising fluids might come from and might go. And that then provides us with better, I guess, conceptual understanding of metallogenic processes which we can then feed into uh, to our other uh, prospectivity studies. There's also another smaller uh, part of that looking at trying to distinguish economic from failed mineral systems by looking at uh, a whole range of um, information that you might derive from drilling data or from regional geochemical data and uh, manipulating that using wavelength analysis. I don't know a lot about that, and unfortunately we don't get anyone talking about it today, but um, the idea behind it is that given a data set from an exploration company, you can analyse it and say whether you're close to or in the vicinity of a large system or whether the system is one of these diffuse systems that Cam was talking about, and you should stop wasting your money there and, uh, and reconsider. All this information that we're collecting and that our colleagues are collecting are being fed now into prospectivity analyses uh, where we are applying the understanding or the best possible knowledge to date of terrain and mineralising processes to analysing the prospectivity of terrains in Western Australia. It's GIS based, you may have read a little bit about it um, if you're reading the right journals. Um, and there are two approaches that we've been taking. One is the data driven approach where we use, uh, been using a weights of evidence analysis of empirical targeting criteria. This is really the, the, the uh, technique that many larger exploration companies have been using as well. And essentially it's testing the geological features in a terrain uh, against the known distribution of a particular type of mineral deposit. In this case it was the gold. Um, and in this particular study that we had done in the, uh, in the Eastern Goldfield by Wally Witt, his name comes up again, um, he looked at 18 separate geological criteria and narrowed it down to there being as little as four significant geological features that you could map for um, and then look at the correlations for to, uh, to better predict where the best possible chance of finding a large gold deposit might be. So for anyone who's interested in reading about that can uh, go to our report number 125 on, on our website. 
leave zone. Free of charge. The other aspect, which is the cutting edge, if you like, is the knowledge-driven mineral systems analysis. And this has really been uh, developed and driven by the CET. Many of the principal players are actually sitting in the room here. And what this approach does is uses this knowledge of the metallogenic processes and the terrain, architecture and geodynamic evolution of a particular terrain to develop mappable geological proxies for the critical processes that might lead to a large mineral deposit. This source, so looking for geological proxies for source, for pathway, for track, and then for preservation as well. And this has been done for a number of terrains in Western Australia and for a number of different commodities. And the output really is a series of probabilistic maps uh, where these proxies are spatially coincident. And I guess in a simplistic way you could consider them as targets, but really they're where, according to our best knowledge, all these processes have been basically focused that's the best place to look. Now these studies that we've done, uh, there are three that we've published so far, there are a number of other ones that are in process at the moment and you'll see the publications from that. Uh, they're just highlighted there on the map. So the first one was in the West Arunta, uh, the next one was in the West Musgraves and we've just recently released one in the Gascoigne region. Now I'm not saying that the targeting that, uh, that we've actually come up with in these, in these publications should be or it is likely to be the best possible one. We welcome anyone to test them. Uh, that would be very good. Uh, but what we're really trying to do is illustrate a new approach to assessing the prospectivity and targeting in particular terrain. And we invite those people who are actually in the business of doing that to basically hard test these or even develop their own approaches if they have other commodities that they're interested in or, uh, or other ways of looking at mineral deposits. So just to give a couple of examples here, these are just um, a couple of illustrations of two significant uranium deposit types in Western Australia. It's really just a sketch to illustrate that we have a conceptual model for how these systems form. And from there we develop, or the researchers develop, the geological proxies that can, uh, can illustrate, can be mapped to illustrate source, pathway, track and preservation and produce a series of these probabilistic maps for these different mineral system types. And the hotspots are where there's the, I guess, the highest probability that all these um, processes and architecture have been operating coincidentally. Uh, for the Western Runter, as well as looking at uranium, we also, the uh, researchers also looked at uh, CX based metals and orogenic gold. In the West Musgraves, in addition to uranium, uh, there's also been some analyses for iron oxide copper gold systems, granite hosted tin tungsten, for magmatic PGEs and nickel copper, and for orogenic and intrusion related gold. So if anyone's interested in those in those particular terrains, or perhaps using these techniques in other terrains for these types of mineral systems, then I urge you to read those. And for the Gascoigne, the one just recently released, again, intrusion related rare earths, the carbonatite hosted ones, orogenic and intrusion related gold, uranium, porphyry based metal systems and granite hosted tin tungsten. Deliberately keeping the, uh, the suite of mineral system types um, or deposit types to a minimum, make it a manageable job for a start, but also choosing those that the terrain has demonstrated that it is probably most likely to be endowed in. And the question we are always asking ourselves, it's very hard to, to get an answer because we need feedback, is are we actually helping? is our approach to, uh, to mineral systems studies um, and, and anything else that we're doing, is it actually helping the industry? Uh, certainly, we know people are using the data because as soon as we release data, there's a flood, a torrent of requests to get access to that data. Uh, so, and the co-funded drilling program uh, is also very popular. Uh, it's usually fully subscribed, oversubscribed in fact. And uh, so we know we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of uptake there. We know then that, or we assume that companies are then using these data for quicker target definition and testing. But for these mineral system studies, these prospectivity analyses, it's, it's hard to say. Um, they've only just been released. We don't know yet whether companies are taking on board any of the, uh, any of the material in those reports or whether they're then taking the concept 
from this cost activity analysis type on board and using it in a slightly different way, please let us know um, and we'll keep, we'll keep doing it or, uh, or we'll modify it. In terms of the co-funded drilling, certainly it is, to our, from our perspective, uh, a success. Uh, this is just a list of some of the co-funded drill holes that have actually intersected significant mineralisation, either the deposit itself or have intersected um, mineralisation that's been enticing enough to keep companies drilling there, which then led to a discovery. I don't uh, expect you to, to read all this, it's in the, uh, in the presentation anyway. Some of the significant examples that anyone working in Western Australia would be aware of, uh, Nova, obviously, um, as well as using our co-funded drilling options, they, they use quite a bit of our data in, uh, in their targeting uh, processes as well. Uh, they used Canadian nickel belt analogues in the first instance, but then using our geological and geophysical mm -hmm. data sets, highlighted areas in Western Australia that they thought were likely to be most prospective for this sort of mineralisation. And lo and behold, Nova turned up, and uh, obviously we've seen the scurry by everyone else to try and stake a piece of that countryside. Uh, uranium uh, and Theseus, Toro Energy used our uh, radiometric data to initially target and then used a, uh, a co-funded drill hole to get access to, to make that discovery there. Uh, Mindax has, uh, has used our, our um, data as well to target paleo channels as has Enterprise Uranium. So we know companies are using our data. Are they using the knowledge as well? We don't know. So, unless anyone tells us otherwise, we're just going to continue with what we're doing. Uh, that will include our push towards integrated geosystem studies. So we want to bring together not only all the data, but also the knowledge that can be derived from it, and then spin that into other useful products. We know it's going to have to be multidisciplinary and a collaborative exercise, and we're going to be focusing on the metallurgy of entire regions, as I've said, and we're hoping that everything that we do will actually better inform mineral prospectivity analyses by ourselves and by our customers out there in, in mineral industry space. There has, as I said, we'll be initially emphasising those less well understood terrains. You've seen some of them already. Uh, we are presently doing similar prospectivity analyses in the West Kimberley and uh, East Kimberley. You'll see the report from the West Kimberley come out hopefully in the next couple of months, the East Kimberley towards the end of the year or early next year. We're then shifting focus to the Capricorn origin for this big collaborative exercise trying to pull apart this, uh, this very large terrain. And you can see the size of, uh, of Victoria there. So we're essentially going to uh, collaboratively pull apart all the geological and met metallogenic aspects of the, the uh, Capricorn <coughs> origin if we can. And we've been doing some strap drilling in the Eucla Basin as well, trying to get through the basement and give us some better understanding of what's beneath the, uh, the later basement there. Into the future, uh, we might be producing pro uh, products such as, for instance, a mineral systems atlas. Uh, we're still umming and ahhing about what that might be, but we're thinking uh, from discussions with John Baronski that it might be simply map-based time slices, or GIS-based time slices through Western Australia's geology, looking at the relationship of the geology at the time with mineralisation at the time and trying to identify significant epochs of mineralisation. Watch this space. Uh, 3D ar crustal architectural models. Uh, we all work in a 3D world. Um, most products traditionally have been 2D. There is now a push to try and get three-dimensional models. Um, most importantly, though, those models have to be um, dynamic, if you like. Uh, we don't just want to produce a model and then leave it. We know that with present processes, it can be very tedious updating these things. So we're working with, again with our research collaborators to try and develop ways of developing these 3D models so that they are constantly <coughs> updated uh, and constantly delivered in a standard format for uh, our customers. Petrophysics would always also be useful. So we're thinking about how we might uh, build a useful petrophysical database. Uh, industry collaboration would be nice there since they have access to lots of rocks and regional indicator mineral chemistry databases. Again, trying to define distal footprints, uh, if you like, of large mineral systems. Some of that work we've started in the Capricorn area. Uh, you can argue 
view of some of the work that Ross's group is doing at Cove's with the, uh, the sulphide geochemistry is an aspect of that as well. Again, watch this space. So again, not just developing concepts for, uh, for minerals, but also trying to develop tools that industry can use. So to conclude, our mandate is unchanged. Our ultimate purpose is to attract industry dollars to the state. Because we're all geologists, we do that by trying to reduce the technical risk, by improving the scope of pre-competitive geoscience data and knowledge. So people um, feel that uh, they know more about the geology and the mineralisation of the state. There's been an evolutionary shift, as I say, towards integrated, collaborative, multidisciplinary, terrain-scale studies, and we're pushing out into areas of cover, um, when or beneath areas of cover, because we recognise that that's where the bigger deposits are most likely to be found. This work that we're doing, our collaborators are doing, are leading to providing a sound framework for mineral system studies, whether we do it or whether industry does it. And from what we can understand, our products, at least at the moment, appear to be encouraging quicker target definition and testing, and we read that as encouraging people to continue looking in Western Australia. That's all I have to say. So this is all the, as I say, the setting the scene for a lot of the technical talks that you'll be seeing later through the day. Thank you for your attention. I did want to put you on the spot about the petrophysics that you mentioned. Um, as far as I know, GSWA doesn't actually do any systematic petrophysics data collection to any extent. That's right, but we're aware that you've asked. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, but I want, wanted to ask you, do you think that's a void that the GSWA should fill, or do you think it's something that's um, maybe better left to individual exploration groups in their specific areas? I don't think there's a right answer to this. It depends on the job. I mean, obviously, companies themselves will have their particular areas they're interested in, and so that if they're doing physical modelling, uh, they will need the physical data. We're interested in the entire state and, uh, and populating our large three-dimensional uh, slash four-dimensional models with appropriate data which should include uh, proper physical data so, that's, uh, so that the geophysical modelling can be done at that scale. So, yeah, it, it's correct, there's no right answer, but it would be nice if we could do it and if we could also obtain information from anyone else who's doing it as well. Like, like we usually do, we'll draw all information from wherever we can. Now, we don't have a, um, a regular program as yet, and we don't have the capacity to do it. We would have to do it the same way other companies would do it and actually commission someone. And that requires, firstly, the, the will to do it, which means that we need the message that we need to be doing that, and then get the money to do it. Okay, uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Thank you.